Welcome once again. My name is Helena Carbon. Um, I am currently the owner of Just World Books, which is proud to be the publisher of uh, both The Gaza Kitchen and many other fine titles. Uh, you can go to our website, www.justworldbooks.com. I also have um, a record of, gosh, about uh, 40 years as a Middle East uh, analyst, writer, reporter, journalist, author, etc., and on the side, a little bit of a troublemaker. Um, I was telling Rob that it's kind of nice to come back to LSE because back um, in 1971 when I was in my first year at Oxford, I applied to come to LSE and um, they accepted me, which was super, but then they wouldn't give me credit for, for the studies that I'd done at Oxford because clearly they didn't think they were of high enough caliber. So anyway, I took the easy option and stuck around in Oxford instead, but it's nice to come back um, to LSE. So um, what we're going to do, Maggie Schmidt and Leila, who will shortly appear, um, will speak between the two of them for around 30 minutes about their wonderful book, The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestinian Culinary Journey. Um, and um, then afterwards there'll be um, opportunity for question and answers from the floor. Of course, we ask you to keep your questions uh, short and to the point and um, to identify yourself before you ask them. And then we need to wrap up at around two, which is why I was eager to get started in spite of all the technical problems. But I think uh, the technical problems are now resolved. Um, so very, very happy to be here with um, actually three very talented people who put this book together. Um, Maggie Schmidt uh, is here um, and Leila is just coming and last year in addition to uh, giving birth to this wonderful book they also gave, each of them gave birth to a baby so you will see and honestly I took the book to the Paris International Cookbook Fair and met cookbook publishers from all around the world and some of them said they were managing you know a team of 35 photographers or you know that it took five years for the book to appear these two women did all the work for this book they in the past three years they did all the research in just six weeks and they may be will tell you a little bit about that in the summer of 2010 rushing up and down the Gaza Strip taking all the really lovely photos that you will see um, taking down the recipes and so on and so forth and then um, at the back of the room with the video is Juan Alcon who did the layout and um, layout for a cookbook is a huge thing as I discovered I'd never published a, a cookbook before so it was a big learning experience for all of us and then at the Paris International Cookbook Fair the book won the uh, award for best Arab cuisine book of 2013 which thank you which was a real testament to Maggie and Leila and one's work on this. Um, so, uh, you have on a piece of paper, or you had somewhere, a brief bio. Leila is a um, distinguished author of an earlier book called Gaza Mom that I had the pleasure to publish in 2010. She's a talented blogger, um, social activist, writer, um, uh, and mother of three from Gaza City. Um, Gaza Mom, her first book, won praise from Hanan Ashrawi, Ali Abu Nema, and others. She was, Leila was born in Kuwait from, uh, to a family which on both sides is originally from Gaza City. Um, and so she would summer every year in Gaza. Now she tries to take her children back um, in order to have them keep the Gaza Hawiya. And she writes all about the problems of Gazans keeping their right to reside in their own homeland and the problems of this, the, the horrible measures that are taken that split up Palestinian families, even from you know, a refugee as her husband is from uh, Lebanon from a refugee or indigenous person from Gaza not allowed to keep your family together so anyway buy that book to go to our website <laughs> Maggie is a writer researcher translator educator and social activist she holds a BA from Harvard and um, is still conducting advanced graduate studies in social anthropology I believe at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid um, 
Maggie has done a lot of work in various media, but I think you will find that the work she's done on this book is really distinctive. Um, people ask, you know, did Maggie do the photographs and, and Leila do the, do the text? No, they both did everything, and it's just amazing how it all came together. So without further ado, oh, I have to announce that copies of the book obviously, will be on sale after the talk. The book is being distributed here in the United Kingdom by Zaytun, who also uh, distribute the fair trade olive oil and other uh, agricultural pro products from the West Bank. Um, and we're hoping that they can soon be distributing products from Gaza. Um, and then now my last thing is I have to keep the speakers to time. So if you would take to the podium. So thank you very much for, for being here. It's a pleasure to present here. Um, how shall we begin? Why in the lights? I, our slideshow, we usually have access to the tools to move up and down through it, but we don't right now, so we'll just have to rely on it. Uh, when, we, when we first started talking about doing this project, uh, when we proposed it to people, suggested the idea of, of writing a, a cookbook about Gaza as a way of telling the history of the place and also uh, the current situation of the place and also as a way of, of collecting the extraordinary cuisine there. People sort of made a face, like it produced a kind of cognitive dissonance for people, that, a cookbook from Gaza, because everyone knows from the media and from the sort of public discourse around Gaza that Gaza is this place, um, always seen in media and other representations from above, from outside, subject to violence, I, I depicted, depending on which media you read, either as a hapless victim or as a terrifying aggressor, but never ever uh, depicted as home to over one and a half million people who, who live their daily lives and do their daily business and cook meals and raise children and uh, figure out how to, you know, get on with life under truly extraordinary circumstances. So, so the idea of the book um, essentially is to sort of zoom in through any one of those windows and get into the intimate spaces, the daily life spaces, uh, people's, ordinary people's, uh, ordinary lives, in order to, which are generally, we should mention, female spaces, um, in order to t get to Gaza, the history of the place, the current situation of the place, from an entirely different angle. And we found that, that food is a really privileged way of doing that, because on the one hand, it's so intimate, especially in the Arab world where where the food that's consumed at home is really, really qualitatively different from the food that's consumed, for example, in the street or in restaurants. Home food is extremely intimate. It belongs to the family. It pertains to this largely feminine space. Uh, it's really sort of at the nucleus and the heart of, of daily family life. And at the same time, because all food must come from somewhere, the domestic economy, the household use of ingredients and the making of food connects that very intimate small uh, individual household and family to the economic situation, the questions of access and borders, what can get into the strip, what can't, what's available on the market, at what price, what's the economic situation of each family that permits them to access or not any given ingredient. Um, and then it connects it also to the, the situation of agriculture, by extension, the problem of water in the region, uh, questions of politics, uh, geopolitics, which are so, the, the Gaza Strip is so very volatile and so very subject to the sort of capricious whims of different political moments that the borders open, they close, they close again, they open again. All of these things can be sort of picked up and reflected in what's on anybody's plate on any given day. So uh, the strategy of the book is kind of to tell the big picture starting from the really small picture. Right. Can I tell? Yeah, sure. We sort of had what we call a three-pronged approach uh, to the book. Uh, we were interested uh, initially in sort of a heritage documentation <clears throat> of these uh, of this sort of uh, folk knowledge of these uh, really fantastic uh, recipes. Gaza, in its own right, has a very uh, unique, uh, very incredible cuisine that is largely unknown 
uh, both to the outside world and to other Palestinians. For obvious reasons, Gaza has been uh, cut off for so long, uh, both from other Palestinians and from the world. Uh, but then we also wanted to sort of uh, profile uh, different individuals, again, in this effort to uh, humanize, to zoom in, as Maggie said, into those windows, into those kitchens. Uh, so we profile not only women in their kitchens, but of all different social classes and statuses and uh, backgrounds, but, and then also uh, men and farmers and economists and analysts and so forth, uh, entrepreneurs and businessmen. Uh, that was also in an effort, and somebody yesterday <laughs> said, well, why would you need to humanize someone? I said, yeah, it's very sad that you know, that would have to be a, a goal that we have to, <laughs> to humanize Palestinians, but especially... Uh, in America, maybe more so than here, uh, we, we do need to do that. And, and the idea is that then if you humanize people, if you've seen how they eat and where they eat and what their rooms look like, uh, it becomes more difficult to support policies uh, intended to harm them. Uh, and finally, we do a fair bit of economic and political analysis. We have little vignettes throughout the book talking about everything from agricultural policy to the debate about uh, sustainability and the impact of the of the blockade and, uh, you know, uh, food aid, the food aid economy, all these kinds of things. So it's kind of a mixed bag. You get a little bit of, uh, of all of that uh, in the book. And, uh, and then of the, of the, we have those three, three strategies and then the sort of fourth other strategy is also photography. Um, the book contains, a, it's, it's very different from most cookbooks, and this was a sort of ongoing debate uh, between all of us of, of what should the photos look like, what photos should we use. Most cookbooks have these sort of succulent, perfectly groomed dishes uh, on the pages. And, and for us, or for me particularly, uh, it was really important that the book be documentary in character and, and show not necessarily these sort of brushed up, polished, uh, delectable dishes, uh, also some of that, but, but principally showing really ordinary people um, mundane details. How, how do people stack dishes in the sink? How do these ordinary little gestures of daily life that, you never, that are never represented, that are never picked up, but do so much, I think, to sort of transmit the sensation of, of what's it like to be in someone's home? What, you know, what does their kitchen smell like? Um, so all of these photos that should be mentioned were taken under, all the photos and all of the research were, was, taken, was done in sort of extraordinary circumstances. It was the middle of summer in Gaza, extraordinarily hot. It was Ramadan, Leila was fasting. Uh, and Gaza is subject to eight to ten hour power cuts that come more or less unpredictably uh, throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, and... Uh, and so, for example, in this particular photo, which we have as sort of a cue to this, this uh, question, uh, we would have spent all day racing around trying to find an ingredient that's at the point of extinction if for some very traditional dish, but the ingredient is nearly extinct because it's a kind of plum tree that only grew up in the north and the hills in the areas that have recently been raised to, to enlarge the buffer zone against the Israeli border. So these plums are now very rare. You can scarcely find them. We finally found a kilo of them in the market. We found someone that could teach us how to make this uh, a stew and also a, uh, a, a sweet jam. We with these plums were in the middle of making it and boom, the lights go out. So uh, trying by all means to, to get the lights, this is me holding up a battery powered neon light to try to take weirdly colored pictures of, uh, of our bubbling pot. So th those were just sort of the circumstances of production of, of all of this. And then in terms of, uh, we often, well, I was going to talk about no, the, the Gaza district, and the, okay. but I can talk about no, no, the I can do map. availability. You want me to talk map. about that first? Okay. So in terms of, we often get asked, uh, I'm always kind of wait for it, especially if I'm speaking to an audience that's principally Palestinian. There's always like an elderly disgruntled man from either the West Bank or some other area of Palestine. Why always the focus on Gaza? You know, so I feel like I always need to address that question. Uh, you know, of course... Principally, it was beyond our scope to cover something larger, although ultimately we dream about doing an all-Palestine uh, uh, documentary cookbook, sort of in the same way, covering diaspora inside, you know, using food again to navigate all of these different things. But this is what we could kind of handle. Of course, I myself am from uh, Gaza, though I grew up largely in diaspora in the Gulf and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and I would commute there 
uh, yearly and uh, for me uh, food was always the source of fascination and uh, at a time when we could not locate ourselves or we, we didn't see ourselves you know uh, mentioned in uh, dictionaries on television screens etc uh, we, we always knew that we had our food and it was a way to connect us as Palestinians and to locate us where uh, maps and modern dictionaries failed to do so. so. But I also noticed that the foods of Gaza were particularly unique, unknown to our West Bank counterparts. So I was always interested in this uh, subject. And then, as Mikey said, we met many years later and uh, the idea came to fruition the, for the book. But the area that we cover in the book is, uh, you know, let, let me just say that what makes Gaza so unique uh, from a culinary standpoint is the fact that uh, the population itself is largely not from Gaza. Uh, so something like 80% of the Palestinians living in the modern day Gaza Strip that you see outlined in white here are actually from towns and villages outside of the Gaza Strip. In this area that you see shaded that was an, first an Ottoman and then a British administrative district known as the Gaza District. Uh, and in 1948 these Palestinians are then driven from their homes and seek refuge in what would become the modern day Gaza Strip that is then uh, sealed around them. And so it makes Gaza, the Gaza Strip, a fascinating place to encounter the culinary traditions and the history of all of the, this area of sort of southwest historic uh, Palestine as a result. Uh, and that is really the, the uh, sort of the departure point. That's where we, what we cover in the book, not just sort of modern Gaza city. Uh, and what we found is a remarkable local specificity when it comes to the food uh, being passed on from generation to generation, areas that are no more than 10 minutes apart really retaining their very specific uh, knowledge and ways of preparing certain dishes down to how you finish a particular stew, complete unfamiliarity with, with dishes. If you're from, you know, Khan Yunus uh, down there in the south, you would uh, be wholly unfamiliar with the, uh, the seafood dishes of Gaza City and also the Shaltit refugee camp, uh, uh, largely composed of refugees from Yaffa, uh, wouldn't know how to make stuffed crabs, uh, wouldn't really use chili peppers as they do in Gaza City, uh, in the same vein, if you are living uh, along the border areas uh, and are originally from the eastern uh, uh, villages, from the, what we call the farming interior of historic Palestine, you would also not be using chili peppers, not using uh, heavy uh, spices. You would largely be relying on seasonal vegetables and grains and, and things like this. So we found a really interesting mix of culinary traditions and again, people are really uh, retaining that knowledge and passing it on from generation to generation. So that's, in short, why, uh, why Gaza? It also represents, I think, in many ways, we talk about telling the story of Gaza through food, uh, but you can also understand the larger Palestinian situation and struggle. Uh, in so many ways, Gaza represents uh, sort of the, the grossest manifestations of, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Israeli policies, and uh, it's always kind of the pilot has always been Gaza first, and then we try something here, and then it... Uh, so really, if you want to understand the larger Palestinian situation, you know, you understand... Gaza. So in many ways it is representative. Um, of Just going back larger. to the, the Lilith point about the refugees coming in and retaining uh, very locally specific foods. For us it, it started to feel almost magical, this sense of you're uh, conducting a ghost, uh, ghost, ghost archaeology of regions, places that no longer exist, places whose names don't appear on any current map, uh, of which no stone is left as evidence that there was ever a population there, but still you can taste them, because not just the generation that fled in 1948, but their children and their children and their children into the third and fourth generation are maintaining these very, very specific local recipes and citing them as, this is how we did this in Bejirja. Bejirja is gone, but you can still taste there's, there's this sort of legacy that's transmitted through generations, and, and that seemed really beautiful to us and important to, to, uh, to compile and to document. The current Gaza Strip, which is of course where we actually did the field work, as Leila said, is composed of uh, about 80% of the population are refugees from other parts of, of historic Palestine. Um, you can see the sort of big clot up there is Gaza City, which is by far the, the biggest urban center, and then, uh, and then along the coast, the very Khan Yunus and, and Rafa as the other sort of major urban areas, and then a number of refugee camps. Refugees aren't located only in the refugee camps. Many families have managed by hook or crook to acquire land or houses outside of the camps, but largely that population is, is still in the camps. Uh, 
We go into some detail in the book, as much as a, its format as a cookbook will, will allow us, um, into the extremely complicated questions of governance in Gaza. It's very hard to summarize what's going on there because, uh, thank you, um, you have uh, the UNRWA, which attends to sort of the needs of of the refugee population much as a state would without being a state. Uh, then you have the elected government and then you have the shadow government and then you have all of the other NGOs uh, that operate largely in function uh, as a function of their their donors requirements rather than local. So there's a a great deal of difficulty uh, centrally planning anything. For example, in agriculture, this becomes absolutely fundamental in an area that has really scarce water resources and is sort of on this countdown, doomsday countdown regarding water. There needs to be some centralized coordination of who can drill and who can't drill and how irrigation works. Um, but there's not because of this incredibly complicated structure of governance, which is the fruit of you know Gaza's repeated uh, the uh, Gaza's totally exceptional political situation, um, and so uh, when we look at questions of agriculture and this debate about sustainability and strategies for making the land sustainable, uh, there's a really lively, really interesting. Uh, very sort of relevant, not only to Gaza, but to everywhere, a uh, debate going on there, uh, which puts to shame anyone who imagines that the only thing that politically people in Gaza are debating is, you know, 67 borders, 48 borders, the, all the, really there are very immediate sort of management questions uh, going on, and, and a very lively political and social debate about them, um, which, was, which was very interesting. I just got off on a total tangent. I wanted to go through the map. Yeah, yeah. The map. Sure. <laughs> just to s discuss the map a little bit more, uh, it's difficult to kind of uh, wrap your head around what it means when we talk about an area being closed off or besieged or blockaded and you know there's always differing reports and it varies from month to month like it's a little bit less closed now we've allowed in three percent more trucks than there was before and now certain imports are allowed in and now they're not and you know uh, but for the most part what one needs to understand is that Gaza has suffered sort of a continuous uh, closure ever since uh, the uh, onset of the Oslo Accords in the early 90s varying degrees of closure it's not nothing new it's certainly not the direct uh, response res uh, of after the elections, for example, or uh, even the disengagement. Uh, so it's just gotten worse and worse. If you can imagine a noose kind of continuously tightening around, around uh, someone's neck, that's what Gaza is. And uh, it suffers from a naval blockade, an aerial blockade, uh, and a land uh, blockade. Uh, the Oslo Accord restricted fishing limits off of Gaza's coast to approximately 20 nautical miles. That really uh, practically translated into about 12, and over the years has been reduced more and more. Right. Yeah. And now it's down to three nautical miles. It kind of goes back and forth between three and six, depending on you know uh, what the latest punitive measure is or <coughs> enforced. But at the moment, it's at three nautical miles. And the deep sea channel, again, you're kind of linking it back to the the foodways, and the uh, is at nine nautical miles. There's this deep sea channel, and that's after that deep sea channels where you have kind of the larger fish and the good catches and uh, prior to that point fishermen are culling smaller fish threatening future populations fishing in polluted waters off central Gaza here because the wastewater management facility has not been uh, repaired uh, so there you have the naval blockade and then in, throughout the book we talk continuously about how yes there's all these different obstacles and barriers but but of the people continually overcoming and and uh, uh, you know whether it's entrepreneurs or whether finding innovations and ways to kind of meet their their everyday needs and demands. Uh, that's what we like to, to discuss. And then, uh, for example, in the case of the fishermen, or maybe I'll put that on hold because I'll go on a different tangent to discuss the. Uh, one thing that uh, that they do is they often will sail down here to the Egyptian border and they'll purchase. Uh, fish from their Egyptian counterparts and then resell that at market. That's what you'll frequently be buying uh, at the market. And or they'll smuggle in frozen fish, which is pretty vital stuff, through the tunnels. Uh, and finally, we met two uh, brothers, two entrepreneurs who, uh, who started Gaza's first inland uh, freshwater fish farm in 2007. And, of course, the idea of having to have a fish farm in, in Gaza is, is a bit absurd, but it proved to be a very successful idea. And, uh, you know, Maggie frequently says that for a population who's, who's been accustomed to eating 
uh, the delicious Mediterranean fish for centuries, they may find the taste of tilapia insipid, but, but it does provide a, a good protein supplement uh, uh, at a fraction of the cost. And the, sort of the aid agencies which operate in, in fads caught on to this idea at the, at the time and began to buy the, the little fish fry from them. And uh, these farms proliferated throughout the Gaza Strip. And just again, a side note, how they would oxygenate the, the water because the uh, fuel was in short supply and the power was going on and off. They would call all the neighborhood kids to splash around in the pool. And so it was kind of a two-in-one. It was like a theme park and it was a fish farm or something. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so these are the Yad and Ziad brothers, which uh, you know, uh, we, we call a, sort of a Laurel and Hardy type routine. Uh, you know, constant banter, nobody's left untouched, uh, hilarious. But anyway, this is again one way uh, that people have been innovating to overcome uh, the different barriers. The, quickly going back to the map again, um, the, um, the land blockade, do you see this pink and red line here? Uh, is what's known as the no-go zone or no-buffer zone. That sort of uh, Israel began to uh, implement following the disengagement in 2005. And at certain points, it uh, encroaches in as, as much as two kilometers, one kilometer, two kilometers, 500 meters, depending where. And half of Gaza's farmland is located within that area and was systematically targeted and destroyed during Operation Cast Lead. Uh, and so this then leads to the problem of the farmers being able to access their land because if they go there, it's sort of at their own peril. And then the land becomes in disuse. They haven't been able to work it. And, and then what do you do in that circumstance? So that's the, the buffer zone. And, and the, finally, just a note on the commercial crossings. There's one commercial crossing, the formal commercial crossing that's operational, the Karim Shalom crossing, that operates at a 2% capacity. Uh, and... Um, and, the, and you know, what that means is that trucks are coming in at a, a much smaller rate than they once were, uh, and uh, almost nothing is allowed out. There's no exports. And, and then we can maybe talk about both the farmers and, and what it means when goods are coming in. But then, yes, there may be things available on the supermarket shelves. We had that beautiful picture of the mulchia and the squashes. Uh, and so somebody who might be reading the newspapers and then visit Gaza would be really confused. Well, wait, I, I heard that Gaza is this place, you know, poor Gaza, you know, that's always being bombarded and, and uh, people are all starving and there's no food, right? We keep hearing that. Uh, so how do you explain this then? There's things, vegetables and fruits available either grown locally, some come in through formal channels, some are brought in through the tunnels. Uh, they're available, but because, because of a siege, a very deliberate siege that has targeted the productive sector, uh, and has impoverished the population on a massive scale with almost universal unemployment, people then cannot afford to buy these goods that might be available. So it's the accessibility versus availability paradigm. And that's a really important distinction to make because, you know, well-meaning activists might continuously cite this in an effort to kind of, people just always want to scream to bring attention to the plight, but it's easily sort of taken apart and it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So uh, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that about the no, Yeah, the I, I mean, the rates and the... One of the this this was an important detail because precisely yeah. in the summer in 2010 right. that we were doing this field work, uh, there was a lot of sort of well-intentioned press claiming that Gaza was starving, and then uh, and then sort of naysayers going and taking pictures of fancy supermarkets in Gaza where everything's available. And indeed, everything is available. But as one economist we spoke to said. Choice is not uh, like having stuff on the shelves, having six different varieties of, uh, of you know, carbonated beverages on the on the shelves, isn't freedom, and it isn't uh, prosperity. It's it, it means that there's a small elite that can afford to buy these things, and as long as there's someone paying for them, someone will figure out how to get them in, whether through the tunnels or or however. The question is, you know. Gaza needs to have an economy that actually functions, that allows people to have a livelihood. And that's, that's really what's taken the blow. So most of the population, and especially since Cast Lead, um, is structurally and chronically unemployed, um, despite the enormous efforts of hundreds of NGOs to sort of make little jobs for them, to keep them kind of busy. Uh, that's really internationally billions of dollars being dumped in, I'm not sure actually what the economy is, but huge quantities of money being dumped in to keep people kind of busy doing something in order to have some kind of an income. But really, uh, raw materials can't come in uh, for manufacture. Uh, exports can't leave. Uh, the internal agriculture is 
hugely stifled by the destruction of all of those border areas, which is principally where the farmland is. And then specifically, each successive round of Israeli bombings have very, very uh, specifically targeted the productive sector. So chicken farms get destroyed, furniture factories get destroyed, uh, really specifically the, the sources of employment and livelihood of uh, the Gazan people. So as well as, for example, the almost 200,000 uh, Gazan men that worked in Israel until 2000 as agricultural and industrial uh, laborers, and then when those borders were sealed to, to uh, labor immigrants, uh, that population is stuck in Gaza without employment. So um, you have a, at the moment and uh, also the money about... And the aid being used per, to purchase uh, goods from Israel, and, and, and basically the Eight dollars end up back in Israel at a two hundred percent. Right, the all, all of that aid that comes in to generate employment, because ultimately Gaza has become sort of a cage of consumers um, who have really no choice at all but to consume Israeli products that are imported at jacked up prices. Uh, all of this money that's dumped into keeping them in some small livelihood ends up returning uh, at an extremely profitable margin to, to Israel. So it's a sort of a, a, a curious strategy. And we, one of the things that was really enlightening in our interviews, particularly with, with a couple of economists and, uh, and UNDP workers, was precisely the, the economy of Gaza, how economically functional it is to keep Gaza um, in the situation it's in. It serves as a... The, we were following very closely during the time we were researching the weekly statements of what things are permitted to enter Gaza and what are not. Um, and it's completely surreal. You, you, you read them and it's just bizarre. Uh, one week, bananas are considered... a terribly, terribly perilous uh, security hazard. Uh, and then the next week they're fine and they're dumped massively onto the Gazan market. So what most characterizes the Gazan market is volatility, just t constant change. And, and studying it a bit, you find that it reflects directly uh, agricultural market surpluses or import surpluses in, in Israel. And so it's a way, it's a very effective way for the Israeli Agricultural Board to uh, sort of level out, product, dump excess surplus onto, onto Gaza. Um, so, so also food served as this sort of interesting way of understanding what are the economic dynamics in this complicated relationship between the Israeli economy and the Gazan one and the Egyptian one. Um, but, yeah, we need to wrap up and we haven't even gotten to talk. Look, we have all these slides and we never get to them. <laughs> Because we like talking so much that we just go on and on. I should just go through the slides just so you can see the pretty pictures of Gaza and get some sense of these people we were talking to. This is an example of a farmer in that buffer zone area that, that you had seen who had lost his you know, many, many hectares of land and 50 beehives and his entire livelihood. We met him at a farmer's workshop because he was trying to, an agricultural union, trying to learn sort of... Uh, what he can do to, to restart, should he, and as with many farmers, face this, had to grapple with this question of, uh, should he uh, replant his, uh, you know, groves of olive trees and fruit orchards that would take many, many years to become productive again, and in the meantime, um, become uh, dependent on food aid, or uh, resort to horticulture, or uh, cash crops that may or may not be allowed to, out of Gaza, like strawberries, very, uh, you know, water-intensive cash crops, and take that gamble of, okay, if they're allowed out, I'll make some money. If they don't, I won't. Uh, and he was trying to learn new, new agricultural practices and, and, you know, very happily posing with these squashes for half an hour, this really jovial, very uh, uh, exuberant personality and spirit that we encountered again and again in Gaza. Uh, the, this is a women's cooperative in uh, Gaza City, Zayt, old Zaytun neighborhood, who banded together and they kind of uh, cook, cater for, uh, for working uh, families and, uh, and uh, functions and so forth, and provide a meager, meager income or the breadwinners of their families, often for their brothers' families as well. Uh, working in a tiny little kitchen, you know, half the size of this front area in, you know, searing like 50 degree heat, uh, no electricity, no power. Uh, but again, uh, feeling, uh, uh, feeling empowered that they're able in some way to uh, provide for their families, uh, retain their dignity, uh, uh, really exemplify this, this daily uh, continuous uh, struggle and sumud to exist and go on with your life despite the impossible odds against them. 
We should wrap up to take questions. We really like questions, so we'll try to control our... Um, so, oh. well, first of all, thank you, Maggie and Layla, for a great presentation. Yeah. I mean, I really think this is the most politically intelligent or perhaps the most intelligently political cookbook you will ever read. <laughs> But it also works fabulously as a cookbook. Everybody who's tried the recipes finds that they work. And, you know, we got um, front page coverage on the uh, food section of the Washington Post. They tried the recipes. They reprinted them. I mean, I think Maggie and Layla's um, bet that food is a good way, a good kind of fairly subversive sort of wooden horse type way to get people to talk about Palestine in new ways is really paying off because that's the first time I've ever seen mention of the Nakba Day in the Washington Post. It had to do with, with the I should book. say that, you know, Andrew over there told me that a friend of his in New Zealand cooked something from the book uh, and received a marriage proposal after the meal was cooked. <laughs> <laughs> so we make all kinds of claims about the cookbook. <laughs> Please come up and buy your copies afterwards. Um, so um, if we'll take a few questions. Um, when you uh, ask a question, say who you are, where you're from. Um, just one question, and then I'm supposed to encourage the speakers to give concise answers, and I'll leave you to handle the rest of the Q&A. <laughs> okay. We're bad at being concise. Not, concise isn't really our, our, our game. But yeah. As you can see, we can put one slide up and talk about it for an hour. So, so questions, yeah. Please. Yes, uh, I'm Anna Hildedam, I'm English. Um, a marriage of Palestinian. Uh, I'm wondering how safe the uh, food that is, what we mm -hmm. include, there is grown in Gaza, is given the amount of depleted uranium that was dumped during house lead. And is any testing being done on that? Mm. Do you have the slide of the. <laughs> of where? No, you don't. Of the woman. We, we may have um, it in the book. Right? Yeah, not how. Um, yeah. Gaza, I mean, there are a number of safety issues with the food. One of them, uh, I think the depleted uranium people are concerned about, and I know that at the university they are testing for it. At the time that we were doing the research, there were still no results, and, and it was much too early really to know. The scary thing about depleted uranium is the sort of long-term effects, and that sort of remains to be seen. And it was um, a big problem as well because they were pulverizing. There was massive... Yeah. UN-sponsored operations to pulverize uh, demolished bombed homes and create kind of a new composite building material out of that because... Because they couldn't import building materials, so they were recycling building materials. Right, and so people were, were really quite concerned about that as well, but, yeah. but also the food, right? But also the food. But even, even depleted, or depleted uranium aside, yeah. um, there's a real issue with pesticides in, in Gaza. Um, we didn't talk about the nutrition no. thing in the end. I, but explain. I mean, it's the, really interesting. I, partly, food, the, the agricultural lands available have been so uh, abruptly reduced, and farmers are really pushing to get maximum uh, yield from very tiny pieces of land. And so they've totally, and, and we spent quite some time talking to uh, some folks that had built an organic pilot farm to try to teach organic farming so methods. They were wonderful. Here on the book, yeah. But to some extent, all of the farmers that they would do workshops with would explain that, like, we would love, we agree that these methods are better. We understand the long-term philosophy of these methods. We should use natural compost and uh, not these toxic pesticides, whatever. But the stress upon them to uh, get maximum yields in short term off of small plots of land with minimal resources, et cetera, was such that every time that pesticides were available coming through the borders, they were really abusing them. Um, and so there were there was an episode they were, they were of watermelon allowed. poisoning. There was serious watermelon poisoning uh, while we were there, and a couple of people we spoke to described really high rates of cancer, etc., largely related to... So there are a lot of health issues that have to do also with the sort of unpredictable and volatile character of, of agriculture, along with everything else there. Borders, the import. Um, there was a massive government composting operation going on, and I was there trying to encourage farmers to sort of giving them free uh, organic compost if they would kind of pledge to at least try to come to some of these workshops and learn how to, uh, you know, farm uh, organically or without dependent th dependence on these pesticides and things like mm. that. So, interesting. So, yeah, a number of issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Sorry. <laughs> Another question, please. Yeah. Amir? 
I guess you both kind of mentioned a little bit the, the class dynamic of people's kitchens. I wonder if you could expand a little bit that, how that affects recipes even from people within the same region or, or hmm. how that came and how you encountered that, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. I mean, a classic example is um, there's this whole category of one bowl dishes called the iyas, what we refer to them as, romaniya, sumagiya, fugaya. And sumagiya is this uh, sumac-infused lamb stew with chard that's uh, sort of quintessentially Gaza City and usually distributed on Eid, uh, the Muslim holidays. Uh, and uh, romaniya is, is uh, more of a, a peasant farmer dish, uh, 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 vegetarian with lentils, pomegranate, sour pomegranates, and uh, eggplant. And if you ask, I remember asking somebody from Gaza City, do you know how to make Romania? And they were like, why would you assume I know how to make that dish? Like kind of turning their noses up, you know, no, that's a peasant dish. Or, I would, or also it's sort of, it's because the fact that it's a vegetarian, the implication being that you, are you suggesting I can't afford to buy meat? You know, you know what? So we, we did encounter a, a fair bit of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what else you... Certainly, I mean, what you see as in terms of different families having access, having an economy that allows them uh, to buy different things, we were surprised. We expected to find more difference in what they were actually cooking. And what we found was a difference in what they were using to cook. So, for example, if you can't afford fresh meat, you buy frozen meat. If you can't afford frozen meat, you buy just bones and make the broth with that and use the broth instead of the meat. So, like, Olive adaptation... Oil, soy oil, you know, semolina, white flour, that kind of thing. I mean, one of the principal sources of change in people's diets is... From, from the sort of historic traditional way of, of making things is that most of the population is directly reliant on food aid and the food aid that comes in is in the form of white flour, salt, sugar, uh, occasionally white rice, and some legume, you know, as the and, and soy oil, not olive oil, which would be the traditional oil there. So um, it also doesn't include any of the fresh fruits or vegetables, etc. So uh, nutritional levels you can track directly to like the rate of people dependent on food aid, um, because uh, families that don't have a cash economy simply can't afford any of the sort of sources of vitamins. Um, so a lot of the traditional dishes that would be elaborated with bulgur or frika or any of these more nutrition, nutri nutritious traditional whole grains are being made with white flour instead. Um, instead of using f meat, people will use, like I said, maybe you know just the chicken feet, feet and heads to, to make the broth, whatever the sort of discard parts. But people mostly making the same dishes they've always made, just adapting the ingredients to, to what they could afford. Um, and, and quite inventive in terms of figuring out how to substitute something with what you can afford in order to get approximately the same result. Um, but definitely some snobbery about, <laughs> you want me to make that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation. Thank you. We haven't even gotten to talk about the food yet. <laughs> even us, as we were doing the research, every time I would be going through, like, Maggie, my mouth was watering, even though I've <laughs> already been doing this for two years now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But, but I was interested in, in sort of the indigenous recipes. So uh, maybe prior a little bit to the migration of, of, of different uh, refugees from different villages. Um, so I think from, from what I understand, uh, just from exposure to Muslim cuisine, and some restaurants and friends and so on. Um, the influence of the cuisine is not necessarily like uh, Turkish, uh, like let's say Syria and Lebanon. Um, it's more, uh, I mean, it has a bit of Egyptian, kind of, and, and, and obviously it has a, it has a tendency for innovation in its, in its um, kind of background. But could you tell me a little bit, maybe a bit about kind of the background? Is there some Persian influence? Uh, but where do you think that uh, comes from? Tracing. I mean, you see, sort of throughout the Middle East, there are uh, there are foods that have 
for example, courtly tastes in medieval times were all based on these richly spiced rice dishes, which are totally a Persian invention, but then get spread throughout the uh, throughout the whole region as sort of part of courtly taste. So if you were an urban sophisticate anywhere in that period, the sort of the fine dish would be this sort of spiced, rich, nicely presented rice thing with uh, this or that other combination. So, so I think historically we could we can trace uh, some of the spice dish then Gaza really amps up the spices in a way that for example I mean Persian cooking never would they're very uh, discreet in their use of spices whereas Gaza which also was right on the spice roots and and a lot of people we spoke to attributed the extravagant use of of spices all the sort of spice root spices the imported Indian the cloves the uh, cinnamon uh, the cardamom the, all of these really uh, uh, perfumey spices in in Gaza in, uh, sort of refined urban dishes uh, to, to Gaza's situation right as, as sort of where the spice routes would cross Arabia and come to the Mediterranean and then spread out through through the Mediterranean world. It was once um, a spice depot and people would, that's where the caravans would stop and that's still, the area is still named that in old Gaza city. I forget what it's called. The caravan said, I know there's a... Right, like a little... A khan. Khan, right. Um, to rest, yeah. So... So yeah, you have you have that influence on the level of sort of courtly tastes. Uh, also, we found some uh, mentions of things a lot like Romania, also dating way back. Uh, those are very old. They're, they're, they're sort of Syrian precedents for uh, recipes like that. Um, very sort of sour, one bowl stew uh, dishes from, again, medieval period. So the influences are various. Um, then the thing that most characterizes sort of indigenous Gaza city cuisine that everybody knows about Gazan food is that it's really spicy in a way that nothing else in the whole region is spicy. I mean, Lebanese won't use practically black pepper. Uh, other places in, in Palestine, maybe they use a little bit of spicy, but Gaza is like, like really spicy, like Thai type, spi- like very hot. And, and that really, you don't find that anywhere else in the region, and that was sort of one of the things that we thought we would find an answer to, looking at history, looking at geography, looking at influences. We really f- have found no explanation, explanation. for and why Gazans like hot food hot so much. The used is, is indigenous to that area. It's, we couldn't, I looked in like encyclopedias and whatever and asked around in Egypt, and it doesn't exist anywhere, I don't know. But Gaza was the once uh, main port along the Mediterranean. That might also explain the use of dill, and dill seed is the other really strange thing because dill is used to some extent in Egypt, not a lot. Uh, certainly not used in the West Bank or, or anywhere. I mean, if you go further off to Turkey and Iran, yes, but not, you know, but dill seed also, how that became. Dill is Egypt. used extravagantly also in Gaza. Right. Totally unlike any of the so immediate neighbors. So it is neighbors. a combination, I think, so. uh, and a factor of its geographic position, like you said. A little bit of Egyptian influence, but again, you have all of Sinai dividing kind of mainland Cairo from the rest of... A little bit of this, a little bit of that, but then it's sort of this amalgamation has become its own thing, so. <laughs> sure. Mark. Yeah, please. Um, I'm thinking practically, I'm thinking about dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you guys tried to adapt the ingredients that are used in the, in the recipes in Gaza to an audience? It's very much so, and we do a little demo, but we (laughs) yeah. Oh, they didn't even show this idea. Um, One of the things that we like to talk about in these talks, but we get ahead of ourselves and talk about other things too, is the process sort of of translating what someone showed us in their home, Mm. uh, which, as we all know, like no serious home cook ever measures anything. So a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit. And, and cooking has this whole sort of grammar. So if you're from a place, like, you know that, and, and then you cook that till it's done. Well, when is it done? How do you know what it's done? What does done look like? You brown it, how brown? So all of these things that, that a, a seasoned home cook doesn't even know how to explain because they seem to her so absolutely evident that you'd have to be a total moron not to, to know that. And, and the, a little of this, a little of that. Um, all completely defy measurement and like the logic of a cookbook. We're translating oral knowledge to written knowledge and it's a big leap. Um, and so that was really the labor of the last few years uh, of with this book was taking 
what we did was take pictures of every single thing that everybody did in order to then and write down or, and, uh, and uh, voice record everything and then go through all of these recordings and the photographs in order to approximate, okay, that little bit of cumin that she put in, I think that was a teaspoon, half a teaspoon, two teaspoons, tablespoon, um, and, and trying these recipes at home. So they're absolutely all, are all, every single one of them, except I think one recipe that was just too weird to do at home, which is for a roasted uh, unripe eggplant uh, uh, watermelon salad. Um, which you have to be in southern Gaza on the beach in the summer in order to make it. Um, but we included it for sort of anthropological curiosity value. Um, otherwise, everything was kitchen tested. Everything is translated into measurement that uh, we lay people understand, and everything is adapted to ingredients you can actually get at you know an ordinary market here. So. Um, is there any cheese making? We actually include a recipe for uh, for fresh cheese, like farmer type cheese, made with UN ration powdered milk. Um, and it's actually it's okay. And yeah. for melting, like for making manaish and whatever, for melting, it's actually it's actually quite adequate. Um, and that's what a lot of people use their uh, I mean, it's just milk ration. Milk powder, you know, it's yeah. milk yeah. powder that it's then diluted. Not cheese making. No, it is cheese. I mean, they and it's those fresh who cheese. have access to dare, to you know, there are still there is a still small there nomadic population. Yeah, but that's never. I mean, it's but not. It's there's not a real cheese tradition in the Middle right. East anyway. Much more common for uh, dairy preservation is kishik, kishik right, which, which is a, a fermented milk. Uh, fermented milk with barley or grain and then dried out in the sun and then it will preserve throughout throughout the year and we also provide recipes for that if yeah. anybody's into fermenting their own because milk. usually they have sort of in a tin cheese and the yeah. families buy it for the whole year right, right. She, no I mean there is Jibna Nebelsi and Nebelsi yeah. cheese Akkawi cheese you're right certainly uh, that is available and much of that brought in from the West Bank when uh, when imports allow and so forth. And then for the daily consumption, those are kind of more expensive now and you wouldn't see the ordinary uh, Gazan family consuming those. Uh, but certainly the the Jibna Beladi, the farmer's cheese, which they can make easily at home, right. they get the rennet tablets and then they can, if they have access to fresh milk through local farmers, they'll get that, otherwise they'll reconstitute the milk powder and they'll make this cheese. And it's, yeah, it's quite tasty in the end. I mean, we, yeah. of course here it would be the idea of using milk powders, but you know, that in the end it's milk. But yeah, the they're, yeah. they're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know if we have time. Maybe one more. Huh? Okay, well, um, again, thank you very much.